sound brings to my mind the feel of leaves crunching under my feet, the feel of mud oozing up between my toes, the scratch of bark on my legs, and the sound of laughter as my friends and I ran through the woods, waded in the creek, shimmied up and down trees, and explored the junkyard on the 80 acres that I called home. That sound reminds me of a risk-filled and adventurous childhood, one that taught me that I had the power to imagine, to dream, to create, to build, to deconstruct, but perhaps most importantly, to fail. It was the sound of my mother calling me home after hours of free and unsupervised play. Today, just four decades later, many American children experience a far different childhood. A cultural shift that started in the 1980s, fueled largely by concern about childhood injury and subsequent lawsuits, has led to changes in playground equipment, activity type, and transportation. We've seen swings and slides get shorter, merry-go-rounds and teeter-totters disappear, and large, multi-structured climbing and jungle gyms made of natural materials replaced with smaller, more modular equipment designed for a singular purpose, often discouraging imaginative play. Activities have become increasingly structured and supervised by adults, and transportation to and from those activities now take place largely by car, rather than walking or biking alone or with friends. And kids that do transport themselves to and from activities are now summoned home by text message with the expectation of an immediate response rather than by cowbell or simply waiting for the sun to go down and them to come home for dinner. Now there's obviously a dichotomy in play here. The difference between risk taking and being at risk. The difference between risk and danger. Nobody's advocating for the latter. I'm a nurse, and in 25 years of bedside nursing as a family nurse practitioner, and now as a nurse educator, I have seen firsthand the health benefits of bike helmets, seat belts, immunizations, hand washing. But risk taking in childhood can reap health benefits that can last years into a child's future. In fact, if we go back and think about these same children who are now transported and changed activity and playing on different playgrounds, is it any wonder that this generation of kids has turned increasingly to the media, to video games, and even to self-destructive behaviors? When you think about it, in comparison to the virtual world that they're experiencing, the real world has got to seem pretty boring. So what kind of risk am I talking about here? Well, risk can be physical, social, or cognitive. Physical risk, in the form of risky childhood play, has been shown across cultures to fall into six categories. The first is great heights. Through climbing, kids learn and develop their gross motor skills, figure out how high they can safely climb, and they gain a different visual and spatial perspective on the world around them. The second category is rapid speeds. Whether on bicycle, zip line, skateboard, kids figure out just how fast they can go without losing control. The third and fourth categories involve the use of dangerous tools, starting out with things like sharp sticks, rocks, hammers, progressing later to knives, saws, other weapons as they grow, and then navigation or experimentation with dangerous elements like fire and deep water. Through learning to use these tools and experience or navigate these elements, knowing that there exists the real potential for harm is exciting to kids, but being trusted with their use brings with it an important sense of pride. The fifth category, rough and tumble play, includes wrestling and roughhousing. And interestingly, across cultures, kids show a definite preference for the more vulnerable position. They like to be the ones being chased, being tickled, being tackled. Perhaps that's because that's the position that requires the greatest skill to overcome and brings with it the most satisfaction with success. The final category, disappearing or being alone. Regardless of whether kids are playing hide and seek, planning a sneak attack, exploring independently in the woods, or even just in their backyard, kids get to experience and experiment with the potential dangers, either real or imagined, of being lost or being alone. Social and cognitive risk are equally as important. 
This includes things like meeting new people, making friends, negotiating, manipulating, exploring and investigating the world around them. Regardless of what type of activity we're talking about here, all of it helps children to develop what they're capable of. Will they fail? Absolutely they will. But a few bumps, bruises, scrapes, hurt feelings, broken hearts, even a few stitches now, can prevent more serious dangers down the road because kids have learned and understand what their limits are. There are other physical health benefits as well. The simple act of spinning around in circles or hanging and swinging upside down actually helps children to develop the vestibular apparatus, which is the balance center in the inner ear, leading to greater coordination. Research has shown that children who are exposed and play in dust and dirt early on have a lower incidence of allergies and asthma, maybe even gastrointestinal infections. That same type of exposure to dirt and dust has also recently been shown to be associated with lower levels of an inflammatory marker called C-reactive protein. That could signal a reduced risk for conditions like diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Think about the impact that could have in adulthood. Psychologically, there are benefits to be had as well. Children who are allowed to encounter challenge and risky childhood play have improved self-esteem, confidence, perseverance, coping skills. Through confronting challenges in the low stakes environment of childhood and learning to navigate their way through failure and the inevitable frustration that results, develops a sense of resilience through that process. Children who are allowed to experience social risk through play, negotiating their way through the inevitable conflicts that are going to arise, produces young people who can balance self-confidence, assertiveness, with empathy and respect for others. So we know all of this now 30 years later. And thanks to the work of academicians, authors, childhood advocates who've published research, written books, write blogs, from disparate disciplines like social psychology, education, history, nursing, medicine, family studies, among others, we are starting to see a glimmer of hope that the pendulum might be about to shift back. We're seeing this through changing parenting practices. We're seeing it through changing policies and even legislation. Just last May, the governor of Utah signed into law the first legislation legalizing free-range parenting in support of children having exactly the type of experiences I'm talking about. So that's all well and fine. But what does that mean for those who were born during the gap, during this culture shift? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you in the audience, raise your hand if you were born between 1990 and 2005? Raise your hands high and take a look around. You are the generation that was raised in a more risk-averse society and likely experienced a more risk-averse childhood than your parents and grandparents. So what does this mean for you? Are you lost, simply doomed to a life of less confidence, less capability, and greater health risk than your parents? I'm going to say no, absolutely not. We know that young children develop at a faster rate, but we don't stop developing as we grow. We don't stop learning just because we become adults. I'm going to say it's not too late to take risk. But here's the thing. The risks that are available to adults tend to bring with them more serious consequences than the risks that are available to children. So in consideration of this reasonable risk, we also need to take into consideration some research that has taken place through cognitive neuroscience. Some of this information was shared by fellow Tedster Sarah Jane Blakemore. We know now through structural and functional MRI studies that the brain, in particular the prefrontal cortex, you can think of that as the part of the brain that is the mind's remote control. It's responsible for helping us make judgments and decisions controlling our impulses and our emotions. We know now that that part of our brain is still developing and growing into our 20s, maybe even our 30s. So even though we face risks now as adults that have potentially greater consequences, it is not too late to start learning. It is not too late to start taking those risks. The question then becomes, though, 
how do we learn to take a reasonable risk? I'm a nurse, like I said, and so I like a good anatomical analogy. And I propose that regardless of your age, when engaging in risk taking, you need three things. A wishbone, a backbone, and a funny bone. Let's start with the wishbone. This is your ability to dream. And unfortunately, I truly believe that most of us adults have kind of forgotten how. We get caught up in our studies, our majors, our careers, our families, our children, the day-to-day -day minutia of our lives that we've created for ourselves, and we've lost touch with our passions and our goals. Nowhere is it written that we only have to follow one path in life. What do you want to do? Do you want to change majors or careers, learn a new hobby, travel, fall in love? I'll admit, I'm a Tolkien fan, and for years I have wanted to know what it's like to be a hobbit and to live in Middle Earth. I hear some of you chuckling out there. My son once told me that if nobody's laughing at your goals, they're not high enough. So there you have it. Dream big. Get back in touch with your passions. Make a bucket list. Cross things off as you go and then make another one and another. The next thing that you need is a backbone. Risk taking at its very core is exploring the ambiguity between fear and excitement. I want you to think for a minute about the terror that you feel during that slow, steep climb up a roller coaster, balanced with that adrenaline rush with the drop. Or about that knot you get in the pit of your stomach when you're meeting somebody new, that fear of rejection, balanced with the euphoria of falling in love. When exploring that ambiguity, you have to, though, consider whether the risk under consideration is a reasonable one. Angela Hanscom on the Tinder McBlog defines reasonable risk this way. Any action, activity, or behavior that starts with careful consideration and results in taking a leap toward the edge of safety or danger. Children learn the nature of reasonable risk the natural way, through trial and error. But adults might need to take a more intentional approach. That's the careful consideration that Angela Hanscom is talking about there. The need to balance the benefits of success with the potential consequences of failure. Also trying to determine what steps can be taken to minimize the risk of failure or of the subsequent consequences. And determining whether or not the risk you're considering aligns with your values. Let me give you an example. For many years, one of the things on my bucket list was skydiving. And so 15 years ago, when my grandmother called me up on the phone and asked me to jump with her to celebrate her 80th birthday, I had a decision to make. What would be the benefits of a potential successful skydive? Crossing something off my bucket list, inevitable adrenaline rush, maybe a funny video, but perhaps, most importantly, not being out-adventured by my 80-year-old grandmother. What are the potential consequences of failure? Well, serious and potentially life-altering injury or death if the parachute doesn't open. Common sense would tell me to keep my feet firmly planted on the ground. But there were also going to be some proactive steps taken to minimize the chances of failure. I would jump tandem with a certified skydiving instructor firmly attached to my back and in control of the ripcord so I could just enjoy the ride. Like all skydivers, my instructor would pack his own parachute to make sure the fabric was intact, cords weren't tangled, so he could be confident in his equipment. I would have to take a lesson so that I knew what to do, what not to do, and what to expect. And finally, there would be fail-safes in place. If the ripcord didn't work, there's a backup ripcord. If the backup ripcord doesn't work, the parachute would automatically deploy at 2,500 feet to compensate for operator error. I considered all of these factors, and I jumped. I loved every minute of it. I could not wait to get back up into the air and do it again. My next opportunity to skydive came two years later. And every factor that I just described to you remained exactly the same, with one exception. I was 10 weeks pregnant with my daughter. So I now had to consider whether or not the risk of skydiving still aligned with my values. And this time, I kept my feet firmly planted on the ground. 
The last thing that you need, and I would argue this is probably the most important, is a funny bone. It is inevitable when taking risk that you are going to encounter a wide range of embarrassment, looking foolish, feeling ridiculous. Usually this happens when you fail, but sometimes it also happens when you succeed. A year ago, I um, sort of trained for a tough mother. I'm proud to say that I successfully overcame all but one of the obstacles, albeit, as you can see, with a lot of help on a majority of them. But regardless of whether I mastered the obstacle or not, at every single one, I experienced a wide range of ridiculousness, looking foolish, even being a little embarrassed. That funny bone is your sense of humor, and it is vital. It is a vital coping mechanism in dealing with the inevitable failure and frustration that results when taking risks. But it also serves as a powerful motivator, one that can drive you on to try again and try again until you succeed. So there you have it, the wishbone, the backbone, and the funny bone. We know how important risk-taking is in childhood and the health benefits that can result. But I am here to tell you it is not too late to start learning how to take risk. And it is not too late to reap the health benefits. So be serious. Be serious about dreaming big. Be serious about the careful consideration of reasonable risk. But never, never take yourself too seriously. I want to leave you with one challenge. Whether physical, social, or cognitive, do one thing each day that scares you. Thank you. You'll be healthier for it.